Oh, I can feel the sun on my chest. <laughs> it just went back behind the corner of the building, my apartment uh, patio. So I'm not going to get much sunshine, but I'll get it right here. But, you know, just the other day, it was kind of humorous was that I had a chance to see a picture of, uh, or hear Greg Glory talking about one of the concerts that has him in it when he was giving a message and was back in 1973. And uh, a year later, <laughs> I ran into Greg Glory at a concert you know, that he was giving in Calvary Riverside and yet to become Harvest. That uh, it was humorous because when I pulled the picture off, I threw his picture on a page and he had long hair because he's bald now. He had long hair and a full red beard. And I, I was laughing because I really couldn't remember what Greg looked like back in 74. You know, I, I kind of, after getting saved, went off on a tangent, so to speak. I went to Calvary Costa Mesa. <laughs> Wow, what a difference. No, no, I'm kidding. But um, it took a few years before I got there. But anyway, long story and short of it is that, oh, I guess it was probably 76, maybe, that I was, maybe 77, somewhere around there. But the point is, is that then I dug up my high school picture, you know, and I posted that, and I looked at myself with long hair, and then I got to thinking about it, you know, as I was relating to people on the internet and discussing with them, you know, what God uses and does, and I thought of all the different places and experiences that I've had from Alaska, where, you know, you deal with the niches, yes, we know nook nook, and we nook nook, and we nook nook, and we tell you what it's like to eat buck duck. <laughs> Natives that are not Eskimos, but, you know, there's all the Inuit and the 37 varieties of natives that live in Alaska, and even more, as they're being identified and languages being coordinated. But the point being is that, you know, I remember dealing with them in one set of peoples, you know, groups. And then likewise, how older Alaskans were different than the newer Alaskans moving up there. And I thought about those days reminded me of my Oregonian days when I first moved to Oregon from California, and I was just a, a city kid that had some country experience, but no mountain experience. And my brother-in-law, you know, took me up into the mountains and about killed me trying to climb them suckers. <laughs> and I remember how different it was to see a small town boy, how he grew up, you know, in a small town and never left that town, you know, and what a difference there was in his perspective being from kind of a farming community, so to speak, and also a mountain community, and being in Oregon. And then I likewise remembered when I was down in Houston, and, you know, I lived there for a while, and how when I first went down, I had to shave my hair off because I was a long hair at the time, and I was a short hair in Houston, because <laughs> you did not want to have hair. That's why I'm wearing this hat today, in honor of different people groups, because you see, there's a redneck in all of us. No. <laughs> but Paul said that he was made all things to all men, lest by any means some might be saved. I found myself in my life experiences, having gone in Catholic churches and Armenian churches and Byzantine churches, having lived in Jerusalem, having been in Reform, having been a conservative, having been uh, Chabad. It was kind of fun, Dad. <laughs> How do you get in Chabad? Good question. The Chabadniks, you know, they come after you, no matter who you are. But the point being is that it was fun. I enjoyed it. You know, there was a, a really wonderful little rabbi that, you know, I, I helped him get his office organized and was his secretary for a while, and then we hired one. And, you know, it's his right-hand man. I kind of helped him for a while. It was kind of neat. You know, it was fun, you know, working with Chalad.
but with all the different people groups, you know, you always find that they had a certain style that they wore, like this hat, you know, that I'm wearing now. Or like how nowadays, you know, you got guys that are dropping their pants down to their knees, you know, thinking that looks cool. I don't know, you know, or like the tattooed ladies or the tattooed men, you know. I remember when, you know, tattoo was a thing of shame, you know. And, <laughs> okay, like whatever. But for me, having been in all these different groups, I found that irregardless of what they were doing, they all experienced the same things. We all need to be loved. We all eat and drink and be merry. We all have a thirst after something more than life. We all enjoy doing our own thing at times and sometimes being a part of the crowd and then sometimes being who we are. You know, God delights himself in the variety of creation. He made it this way. It wasn't like he said, oh, well, I made one tree and I made one plant and I made one person and that's the way everything looks. No. If you watch anything that grows, you don't see a complete uniformity, though you may say so when you grow corn, you know, you see all these in a nice row. <laughs> but if you look closer, they're each one uniquely and distinctly different. The same is true about you and I. Now, because he made us uniquely and distinctly different, a lot of times different ways or different means that the Holy Spirit uses will inspire us in a different way. For some people, they may see a dead duck on the side of the road and shoot it. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Or they may see the broad side of a barn and try to hit it. Or they may see deer season, you know, or duck season, or football season, or basketball season, or baseball season, or whatever season. But salvation God brought to us to develop a relationship with Him, our Father, so that irregardless of the season we're in or the person we are, He could meet us where we are, the way we are, as we are. You don't have to, you know, be all decked out in some, you know, really expensive, you know, um, suit and tie, you know, and come to church looking like a million bucks with all your jewelry, you know, and kind of showing off for the folks, you know, because everybody else is wearing jewelry, but if you are, okay. Or you don't have to put on a talis, you know, and kind of, you know, act the whole holy part, because frankly, you know, when you put on a talis, you're shutting out everybody else around you. What kind of fellowship is that? You know, or you don't have to bind a box on your forehead, you know, to get closer to God. You don't have to kneel down, you know, and kind of like... You know, genuflect and effuflect and whatever flect it is, because you're meant to reflect, reflect God's love for one another by holding hands sometimes and arm in arm and sharing the love. But in all of these things, when God meets you there, He cares so much for you that He may appear to you as being some, some personal interpretation of who he is like I had a guy yesterday he contacted me and he says sounded he made it sound so important you know like it was sounded more like a trick question he says what color is God and you know to me the answer was obvious but maybe it's not answered maybe it's not obvious to you maybe maybe you're red yellow black or white and you're trying to figure out which way is right <laughs> maybe to you God is white or maybe to you, God is black. Or maybe to you, God is a Chinaman or a, or something, you know, but... Or a Japanese man, or a Korean man, or whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. Because, you see, when he asked me what color is God, I said, well, color is from a refraction or a diffraction of light. When you shine light into a prism, then it splits up into multicolors. But the light is what is creating the color. God is light. It was that simple. It didn't give him the answer he wanted, but it gave him the answer the Bible says. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And so asking what color is God was kind of silly to me, you know, 
because it was pretty obvious and I always thought, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad Jesus gives me certain answers that don't give people what they want, but it does answer what they have. And sometimes, you know, you may find that your interpretation of God may be a little bit customized for you, but the more you get to know God, the less you're going to be worried about what kind of hat you're wearing, whether it's frontwards, backwards, or sideways, or whether you have, you know, fancy clothes on, or whether you're bringing it down to block the sun, or whether it's just a gift that somebody gave you, you know, you could just throw it away as easy as you could keep it. God wants to meet you always and be with you always as you are learning about Him. So, you know, if you're caught up in some messiatic or some whatever, seventh day, Seventhists, or you're into Sunday only, you know, or some Jesus only, you know, try to get to know a little more than just what you think you know, and begin to experience God in a complete way that he would reveal to you, because it's a wide variety of experience that God is going to take you through in order to reveal Jesus in the way that he wants you to understand him for your personal growth and development. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them in Numbers 10.33, stream from the desert. God gives us impressions, but not that we should act on them as impressions. If the impression be from God, he will himself give sufficient evidence to establish it beyond the possibility of a doubt. How beautiful is the story of Jeremiah, of the impression that came to him respecting the purchase of the land of Anathoth. But Jeremiah did not act upon this impression until after the following day, when his uncle came to him and brought him external evidence by making a proposal for the purchase. Then Jeremiah said, I knew this was the word of the Lord. He waited until God seconded, seconded the impression by providence or by the circumstance. You see, providence is a old English verb or word that was used to use what we call the circumstantial evidence of something happening that comes from God's planning and provision of it, which is why we call it providence. Providence is really a fun term if you can really understand it for what it means. And when you do apply it, when you say the providence of God involves his planning, as well as his purpose, as well as design, as well as his prophecy, as well as his fulfillment, as well as his circumstances all coming together, then what a beautiful word providence becomes. Because then you can trust in God's providence because he provides himself as the fulfillment of it. But unfortunately, people, you know, get confused about words that are longer than four letters. <laughs> and sometimes they don't know what it means. So it takes explanation. And with God's providence, it's like that. God's providence came together. And so Jeremiah knew that was a word from the Lord. He waited until God seconded the impression of my providence. And then he acted in full view of the open facts which could bring conviction unto others as well as to himself. God wants us to act according to his mind. We are not to ignore the shepherd's personal voice, but like Paul and his companions at Troas, we are to listen to all the voices that speak and gather from all the circumstances as they did the full mind of the Lord. Sometimes it is a benefit to re-examine what we think we know according to what we do know, which means look at the Word of God, look at the counsel of God, look at the circumstances in your life, look at your personal application to it, look at your personal inspiration from it, and then take it to the Lord in prayer and then leave it there and see if something comes to confirm it. Because if you really don't know and you can't trust God in the way that you should, then trust God in the way that he wrote, which was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart, 
Be not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Apply all the wisdom that God has given you in the word to make it real in your life so you know this is the word of the Lord for you. Because, like I said, hey, depending on what hat you're wearing, sometimes even the way you're wearing it, it's either noon, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, or midnight. <laughs> or it may be influencing the way you're looking at it, hat on or hat off. Make sure and reassure yourself in the Lord by way of what he has said to do that you know it's from him and not from you. Because believe me, the easiest way to get confused is for you to do it.